does now. I think everybody has got peace stakes on their display. Um, he probably wishes he got a cut from everyone that's sitting on our lawns, but he doesn't, unfortunately. Um, so with, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to David Peace. He's going to give his discussion on GPL pins and a little bit about experience lights. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Yeah, thanks. Um, appreciate it. So um, yeah, my name is David. Like I said, I'm from uh, uh, with Experience Lights. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm going to go through some stuff with GPIO. Um, I tend to, when I talk about this stuff, um, try to uh, start a little bit from the basics and then build up. So I'm going to go through some stuff that might be a little bit obvious to some, um, but uh, feel free to, uh, like, like uh, Daryl said, you know, free following. If you need to interrupt me, ask a question, please do. Um, I'm going to go over just a, a quick PowerPoint first, and then um, we'll dive into FPP and go through some uh, GPIO stuff. So let me just share my screen here. And we got it. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm co-founder of Experience Lights. Uh, do Experience Lights with my uh, good friend, Lee Lindquist. Um, developed the Pixel 2 Things line of products. So we have um, pixel bridges that you can use pixel data to run other things. Um, actually, my wife is the inventor of the, uh, the, the pixel stakes that uh, you were referring to. Um, I developed some free online tools that people use at lightshowhub.com where people can um, use our megatree calculator and a custom model builder. And um, I've just been really heavily involved with um, a lot of the Facebook on, like, online communities. So, um, why interactivity? So just, you know, why does somebody want to do the, um, the interactive component for their light shows? Uh, well, for residential, um, interactivity is very fun, provides positive vibes, promote, and promotes a giving attitude for charities. And um, this next bullet is something that's very close to me because I had a lot of very angry people in cars. Um, we actually blocked off our road so people couldn't come in anymore um, and they had to walk up. Um, and uh, by people getting out of their cars, they're really less angry, um, they're nicer. So if your um, area is conducive to that, it's much nicer to um, have people walk up rather than drive and have all the traffic and the angry people. So it makes them nicer. Um, can reduce noise and appease neighbors. Um, if you guys have seen the, the builds for the push button for music, uh, it can make things move, bring things to life. So um, a, lot of, a lot of good reasons for residential. Um, certainly um, for a lot of us, it's just a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, and then there's a lot of value for, for the commercial side as well. So when people are taking uh, selfies, for instance, in front of uh, your, your uh, brands, you're gonna get more social posts, more brand visibility. Um, interactivity is fun, recur uh, encourages more referral business. And there's a lift in revenue. So um, there was a study done that was by keeping people present and engaged in some kind of interactive, interactive activity, there was an average 66% lift in keeping people present and engaged rather than just something where they would passively watch. So um, last year, um, we did a show uh, at a local area called the California Center for the Arts, and we put the EFL design wings up on the wall and had a little um, a little selfie station where people could put push, and push buttons on a podium. So um, there was a lot of interest in this. So we put a build uh, together, uh, put a video together, which you can see on YouTube that takes you step-by-step step through this process where people could um, press the button and change the color of the wings before they took a picture. Um, what was really interesting about this, because this is the first time I've done anything interactive in a light show is we had this crazy light show going on with a pirate ship and cannon shooting and smoke and you know snow and all of this stuff, crazy light show. And there was just a huge long line that was never ending for the selfie station. So it really proved to be something that was um, pretty, pretty amazing um, and something that we're looking forward to grow this year. So we talked about, um, so let's talk about some different types of interactivity. Um, like you guys have seen the push button for music. Uh, this is primarily for a residential install. 
Um, and you're going to notice some similarities between a lot of these things that people use for interactivities in their display. But in this case, you can see we have um, a relay right here. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, but a relay is really at the heart of a lot of interactivity. Um, here's a remote control relay. So this is something where you can actually trigger effects uh, in FPP from far away, have it in your pocket, you know, have a kid wave a wand and you press a button and they make, you know, make it seem like they're changing the show themselves. Um, you could do motion sensors. Obviously this is really popular in Halloween shows, um, but there's lots of opportunities in uh, Christmas shows as well. Uh, in addition, there's um, the ability to do some more advanced scripting, which we'll get into in just a little bit where motion sensing um, would be very interesting. Um, same thing with break beams, also very popular in the Halloween crowd. This is a invisible beam that when you cross it will trigger, um, will trigger an internal relay that can then be used to fire effects. So what do all these things have in common? There's some sort of physical input or physical change in the environment that causes the light show behavior to change. So how does that happen? And um, we're going to talk about a button. So what is a button? So we're going to start off real simple. I don't know if you guys can see my video or not, but uh, you have a push button, right? And a push button is very simply a switch. And it's most co often called a button is going to be a normally open single pull, single throw switch, which is a very big mouthful. Um, so a single pull means that we have one switching um, uh, uh, switching uh, line um, and it's normally open. So in its relaxed state, when it's not being triggered, this means that the continuity is not, not there. You'll hear this a lot, normally open and normally closed. Um, I hope you guys can see my video. Um, basically what that means is normally open is going to be that the wires are not touching normally closed is that they're going to be defaults in the in the touching state so this is essentially um the the default state when a button or a relay is not switched or not activated but then there's all sorts of other different types of uh, switches as well so we have single pull single throw single pull double throw double pull single throw and double pull double throw uh, all of these things are not meant to confuse you. They all have their, uh, their different purposes. Um, if you guys have ever heard of a limit switch or actually even these buttons as well, they have a single pull double throw switch in them. And what that means is um, it has three contacts. It has the common contact, which is this guy right here. And um, I just, can you guys see my mouse? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, this, this guy right here would be the common terminal. And then you have the normally closed terminal, which means that in its relaxed, unactuated state, it's connecting the normally closed or the NC. And then you have the normally open, which is um, not connected. So you have three different contacts on that. And then when the button is pressed, this little guy moves to the other contact. So that's the, the normally open contact. Um, and then when you get into the double pull, double throw, you get to get into some really interesting things that you can do because you can actually reverse polarity. And um, I don't actually have the schematic for that here because it actually gets a little bit crazy. But what that means is if you put in uh, 12 volts on this line and uh, ground on this line, for instance, you can wire up the double pull, double throw relay uh, in a fancy way such that in one direction, the uh, 12 volts is coming off one leg, um, and then in the other way, it's coming off the other leg. So it's very interesting uh, to, uh, to use that in if you need to reverse polarity. So um, if you guys are familiar with um, linear actuators, uh, those will require, um, or, or, or motors, right? Those require um, reverse polarity to change the direction that it is going. So a linear actuator is is a rod that moves um, in and out of a shaft um, and you reverse polarity. Uh, so one way is going out and the other, you reverse the polarity and it comes back. Um, and then a motor, uh, polarity one way will spin the motor one direction. You reverse the polarity, the motor will spin the other direction. And those usually are with some sort of um, double pull, double throw relay to reverse that polarity.
So uh, then we have, so we talked about the, the switches, right? And then there's um, what's uh, going to be uh, a mechanical switch or a relay. And this is a coil actuated switch. What this means is instead of a physical contact changing the state of the switch, it takes an electrical signal to, um, uh, to energize a coil and that coil will then um, change the state of that switch. So in the case of these, um, these buttons, the SP, uh, the single pro double throw, for instance, if you're, you need to physically press a button for that to change state. But if you have a digital system where you want something to change um, based on a, uh, uh, some sort of programmatic input, not a physical input, you can use a relay to energize a coil and then switch that relay for you. So um, there's a lot, so we talked about the different types of inputs um, earlier and at the heart of these, they all have some sort of relay. So, um, you know, we talked about the remote control relay. So for this guy, you can see on the bottom, it has an NC, a common and an NO. So normally closed, the common is the, the center tap and then the normally open, and then it has a power terminal. Um, so what this means is, um, if you were to wire this to uh, a GPIO trigger, for instance, you could have that tied to the, so the common would be tied to, to the ground terminal, and then the normally open terminal would be tied to the GPIO. And what that would mean is by default, the GPIO pin is not connected to ground and you would have a pull-up resistor. And we'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, and then when the relay is activated, then they connect and therefore the pin, the GPIO pin is pulled to ground. So that is then when you can use FPP to trigger an effect. So in this case, it would be for a remote control effect. The reverse of that would be um, to have a pull up, or excuse me, a pull down resistor. And you can use the normally cl uh, closed terminal, excuse me, you can still use the normally uh, open, but instead have a positive voltage of 3.3. That's less common because it is a low voltage device. It is more dangerous to do it that way. Um, and quite frankly, and we'll talk about this in a sec as well, you don't really want to hook directly up to a GPIO pin. Um, you need to have a resistor or some other kind of um, optocoupler in between that to protect your GPIOs. It's possible. I have done it. If you know what you're doing, it's fine, but you could definitely zap a pin. Um, so it's not, not advised. Um, then we talked about the break beam, right? Where we have this invisible beam um, also has a relay in there. So as soon as that beam is broken, um, it, act, it activates that relay and then it can then trigger um, a GPIO trigger. And it has the same thing. It has uh, the common terminal, the normally open terminal and the normally closed terminal. So you're seeing a pattern here. All of these types of input triggers are using a very similar mechanism, which is a switch, but a mechanical switch um, called a relay to um, toggle the, the pins high or low. Um, and then we have the motion sensor, same thing. So it has its relay in there with the normally open and normally closed. Um, uh, and they, they call it alarm and tamper. It's, it's the same thing. It's used for you know, home, home, um, home uh, security systems. And then this is what I was talking about with, with, the, with the buttons. Um, they all have these uh, switches. They're the single pole, double throw. Uh, which means by default, the common terminal is connected to the normally closed contact. And you can actually kind of see it in this graphic here. It's hard to see. Um, and then when the button is actuated, which pushes this little yellow nub, it physically changes from normally closed to normally open and then connects common to normally open instead. Okay. I'm gonna go into a little bit of FPP, but before I do, does anyone have any questions on um, relays and how that, right, and buttons or, and um, switches and how that works with regards to triggering a GPIO pin? Okay, gonna yeah, take that as everybody's great. Okay, so the way that FPP handles triggers is, um, 
you have your hold on. You have your uh, Raspberry Pi and you have a bunch of GPIO pins, right? And sorry, it's hard to see here. Um, a bunch of GPIO pins. And um, you can either trigger FPP to either perform an event when that pin is pulled high, which would need to be 3.3 volts and not higher, right? Because it's a low, low voltage device. Or um, when it's pulled to ground, when it's pulled low to trigger um, some sort of event or action. Uh, typically, you're going to want to do it on a pull low if you're connecting directly to a GPIO pin. And if you are connecting to directly to a GIP, GPIO pin, um, you'll need to use a resistor. I'm not going to tell you what size because I don't want people actually doing it. Um, and then I'm going to be held responsible. Better to use a hat. So use a pie hat from Falcon or use the, you know, the in and out pie hat from Experience Lights. Use something else to trigger the, um, the GPIOs um, safely. So um, we're going to get uh, set up real quick. I'm um, going to share my screen again. Do you have a sample of that hat? Uh, yeah, uh, this is the, the, the one that my company sells. This is the, um, this is the in and out Pi hat. So this has uh, six input triggers, so terminals for triggering inputs, and then two pixel outputs. So that's why it's called the, the in and out Pi hat. Um, and this can um, be powered from your Raspberry Pi as well. So you can actually just use the five volts to power your triggers if you need to as well. So um, let's do a quick test. So I have my Raspberry Pi hooked up here. And, and I apologize, I don't have a multi-camera system. So you're going to have to take my, my, my word at a, a few of these things. So I am going to be tying into pin 26 here. Um, and I am going to be doing a pull down resistor. So what the, so I have a, um, uh, an in and out pie hat. It also has an integrated pull down resistor. So I don't actually need to do this. I just do it for good measure, but let me explain what a pull up and a pull down does just so some, um, just for everybody to understand. So you have a GPI open and in order to trigger something, it needs to say trigger when I am high meaning 3.3 volts or trigger when I am low at zero volts or, or ground. And if you have no pull up or pull down resistor, by default, what's gonna happen is that pin is gonna be considered what is called floating. Um, and it is neither high nor low. And it just you know, depends which way the wind blows, how it's going to read, and it's going to be inconsistent. So typically what you do is you have a resistor that is tied to 3.3 um, volts. or you have a resistor that's tied down to ground, and that's called a pull up or a pull down resistor, which means that if nothing else impacts that input, that GPIO, it is going to read high or low. So if I have a pull down resistor, if I am not um, applying any kind of change to my GPIO, it is going to read as low, which means that I need to do a command on the rising edge, which means when I transition from low to a high, then execute a command. And it's very quite simple. Um, 99 times probably out of 100, um, everybody's going to be doing something related to playing a, a sequence. Um, that is largely what people are using this for. So you're going to say, uh, start a playlist, start a playlist at a specific um, item. I really should have set up some test data here. I apologize. I don't have any. Um, uh, playlists in here, but it's very, very simple. You would just select it from the list. And um, these other checkboxes are actually quite important. They were just added recently. So uh, I was very glad about that. Um, so especially if you're doing a selfie station, you might want to say, okay, if I hit the button that is the red button, and usually I give these a name. If I hit the red button, then I want to play the sequence that is called the red, the red wings sequence. Um, but I want that to continue forever. So I'm going to hit repeating. And then I'm only going to start it if it's not running. And what that means is if someone comes up and starts pressing the red button and they press it over and over and over and over, it's not going to just keep restarting the sequence. Before, that's what would happen. It would just keep restarting it every time you press the button. Now, if the red sequence is currently running, it will not 
run it again. It won't restart it um, unless it is not currently running. Um, and uh, repeat, yeah, we just wanted to repeat forever until somebody changes, changes the pattern. At the heart of it, people don't really care what the color is. They just wanna press the button and, and see it change colors, right? But there's quite a bit more to these buttons that you can do. Um, I'm not gonna go through these one by one, but there is some very interesting things that we can do that people might not consider. Um, so for instance, you could do a uh, FSEQ effects start and stop. If you guys are not familiar with what an effect is, um, we, you may be familiar with an FSEQ, which is the, um, the rasterized uh, sequence file, right? Uh, but you can actually create a, uh, a, an effect file as well. If you basically um, want to, let's talk about the, 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 the wings again. If I have an effect on the wings, um, this is a beautiful example, uh, effect on the wings that I wanna uh, basically show up, but I don't want it to impact the show that is currently running. You can actually do what's considered uh, called starting an effect, which basically overlays on top of your existing show and it doesn't stop it. So you don't have to do either or, and you can have them going at the same time. And so what that entails is you click on the model and you go to model, render and export. And that's going to uh, create an ESEQ file. And then that can be imported into F FPP and triggered as its own effect. And when that effect starts and you tell it the start channel, it will keep your show running as it is, especially if you're using the same Raspberry Pi for um, your selfie station as you are for your show. Um, and it will overlay it on top of it. Um, and then there's also the ability to do scripting. And this is a more advanced topic, but I'm still going to go into it because I think it's interesting and I think it's probably a little bit underutilized. Um, so I'm going to go to content setup file manager. I'm going to go to scripts. So we're going to create a new script and I'm going to type it out here and it's going to be bash. And I don't expect people to know bash. Um, I don't expect people to know what I'm about to type, but this is all just fuel, right? So I want to fuel people's ideas and creativity. If you get some good ideas from that, then great. Um, so I'm going to write a little bash script. You always put um, slash bin bash at the top to signify where the binary is for the, um, what you're running. And we're, what we're going to do is implement a counter. And what this means is... Uh, let's say we have a break beam that is at the entrance of our show and we just wanna count the number of people that walk through. Um, so I'm gonna create a little script that says, hey, every time my GPIO is triggered, I want to increment and increment, increment the number of people that have come through. Um, so there's a command called touch, which essentially will create a file if it doesn't already exist. So we're gonna create peoplecounter.csv. And if that file already exists, um, we're going to pull in that, that information. So this command here is just reading from the CSV file into a variable called current count. So the first one is creating it if it doesn't exist. And the second one is reading the file so if there's already a value in there, it's going to read it in. And then we're going to do a new count, which is just going to basically increment the current count plus one. So uh, now we have a new variable called new count, which is taking whatever was in the file, the CSV file, and we're going to add one to it. And then we're going to just put that file or put that new number back into that same file. So that's, that's it. So I'm going to save that as peoplecounter.sh. OK, so creating a new file if it doesn't exist, we're just bringing in the value. It's just a text file. So it's just bringing in that value into current count. We're adding one to it. And then we're going to put the new value back into that file. We're going to overwrite it with a new thing. So I'm going to come into scripts. I'm going to select the peoplecounter.sh. So now we have that script here. So if I go back to my GPIO inputs, I'm going to do, what did I say? 26. 
Okay, so I'm going to do 26. I'm going to do a pull down just for good measure. And I'm going to run a script. And it's going to be people counter. All right. So that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to hit save, restart. So now when I trigger my, my input, which I'm going to do with these highly scientific tweezers, I'm going to take it and I'm going to trigger input 26. Okay. You're going to have to trust me that that actually did trigger. We'll see. We'll see the proof is in the pudding. So uh, we have a new file now. So you can see it created peoplecounter.csv. If I view that, it now says the number one because I triggered it one time. Okay, so I'm going to close that. Are you literally to... just shorting out the pins? Is that what you're doing? That's yeah, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it's very scientific. It's it's a mechanical switch. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, it's a mechanical switch. I I yeah, very prepared here. Um, there you go. Just triggered it a couple more times. Now it's at three. Okay, so you can see this is a very very simple way to count, right? But there's not much value in that if you don't have any like date information associated with it, right? So um, let's alter our script. And this is once it's uploaded, then you can actually edit it straight in here. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna change the file name to uh, People Tracker CSV. And so I'm going to create a new variable called date. And that's going to be date plus y dash n dash b. This is um, going to, this is basically just a date format for year, month, date. Um, and I'm going to create a time variable uh, with a different format, which is going to be h. Uh, HMS. All right. Yep. And then we're going to take that. We're going to, so that's just an escape pattern. Like I said, I don't expect you guys to know this, all of this, but um, hopefully to inspire some ideas. So before you'll notice I did one car uh, carrot. So that was called carrot. Uh, now I'm doing two. This is going to append to the file. So it's going to add to the end of it rather than replace it. And if I did this right, it looks correct. Um, every time the trigger hits, it's going to add a date and timestamp to the CSV on a new line. So I'm going to now very scientifically take my mechanical switch, short the pins out. <laughs> and I'm going to just do it a couple times. One, two, three. And if I did everything right, if I refresh the page, there's the page counter. Oops, wrong one, tracker. There we go. And then you can see the date and the time that somebody walked through. So now you have a CSV file of every time somebody triggered something. Now, you could still even have this this type of data happening when somebody pushes the button for the selfie station. Now, me as a data nerd, I think that's very interesting, right? So to see, you know, when is the peak times of people that are coming through my display and actually hitting the buttons? Or what is the most popular button? Um, so you can actually send through command, uh, excuse me, arguments. So you can say they hit the red button, the green button, the blue button, um, and then store that in the CSV. You can see here we have script arguments that you can send to the script and it can read those and then put those into the file as well. So um, I really like that. Uh, just again, from a data standpoint, I'm def I didn't do it last year. I'm planning on doing it this year um, so that I can get a better idea of how frequently people are using it. You know, is there a tendency towards different colors? It doesn't mean anything other than it's just interesting information. Um, yeah. Okay. So that is all of that. Um, oh, and here's, yeah, so this is what I'm using. Uh, this is the in and out Pi Hat um, that we sell. Uh, it has uh, the terminals for the input triggers and then pixel output as well. Um, but if you have um, a 12 volt power supply that you're using for your pixels, you can actually, it has a step down buck on it 
so that that 12 volt that powers your pixels will also power your Raspberry Pi. It'll step it down to five volts. Um, I believe it's two amp, two amp, 2.5 amp um, buck converter to, to power your Raspberry Pi as well. So when you trigger that input, you can see which uh, GPIO pin is actually being triggered within FPP. And then you can go into FPP and actually do the um, do whatever you want, which is, you know, a lot of people are using it for volume, um, you know, especially if they have a, a push button for lights, this can adjust the uh, increase or decrease the volume. Um, they can use the, uh, I don't really have it here with me, little triangle buttons, you know, for left and right or plus and minus. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I just highly encourage you to explore DMX if you have not done it. Um, when it comes to interactivity, uh, D DMX is, uh, there's like just a million and one different uh, utilities you can use out there that are all standardized on this protocol DMX. And so if you're using um, the Falcon Pi Hat or uh, a Colt board or um, a Falcon um, or one of the, the new Genius boards, they all have DMX output, right? And so you can use that to control as part of a normal sequence, these these DMX effects. I've used the CO2 jet and it's rad. Um, if you're just dimming AC, standard AC dimmer, obviously people are really into moving heads right now. There's tons of, it's so hot right now. Um, so lots of different options there with, uh, with DMX. So I highly encourage that if um, just, just to add to that experience of interactivity. You know, I always, uh, another thing that I think would be really fun is when they're taking their selfie, you know, just randomly, not every time you just like blow a thing of smoke in their face and just like then take a pic, they'll you know, take a picture with the reaction. That'd be fun. So that's it. So GPIO triggers with an FPP, super, super simple, right? You know, I got into some more complex stuff with the scripting, but like I said, 99% of people are going to just be using this for starting a playlist, changing the sequence, um, or, or doing an effect. Um, I just did this last year for the first time. Um, I already have a ton of ideas on how to expand it. I'm sure people are going to take this idea and do all sorts of crazy stuff with it this year as well. Um, so be creative. But there is just, just a, a ton of options for what can be done with an FPP when that GPIO is triggered. Um, the only thing I would caution again is to not... Um, not connect directly to the GPIO pins without A, understanding what you're doing and being have some sort of protection in between uh, because you can and you will zap those ports or zap your Pi and it will be sad. That's it, that's all I got, quick and easy. So uh, I'm sure there's some people in here with some, some questions. So if you have any questions, let me know and I can uh, try to answer. Real quick on the CSV file, when you did the date time commands on that, are those all the same or very similar Excel file uh, mm -hmm. commands? Yeah, so you would take that CSV and you would just bring it into Excel. And in fact, I can I can just do that real quick just to show you. Because when you, when you were doing those, I'm like, those look very similar to the ones used in Excel, so. it's Yeah, it's exactly the same, yep. Okay. Yep, so if I go back to file manager, scripts so there's my csv i'm going to download that and then open that and so it's very slow so i actually have a vehicle tracker built with like what you've done there oh nice nice so uh, well someone helped me build it because i don't know all the ins and outs but it's very similar to counting and doing that yeah, and you can, yeah, and it's great because you can do this similar thing where um, somebody drives over the trigger, right, and triggers a counter on a file, like something like this. So, but yeah, and then this is where the fun part comes in, at least if you're, if you're into data, right, then you start charting the stuff out over time and, you know, seeing how often things are pushed and what's being pushed and when they're being pushed, so it's pretty cool. So I see somebody's hand being raised. I don't know how to, do I need to do something with that? And just call on. They, just they acknowledge it. 
Yeah. All right, David. David hey, Thomas. how you doing, David? Hey, good. Hey, um, my question is, does this only work with the uh, Raspberry Pi? Is that the only thing that it works with? I, I don't think so. No, I think it works with any Linux device, whether it's Beagle or Orange. Um, I think all of them are probably going to have their own different way, you know, there's certainly different numbering schemes, um, you know, on how they're different numbered. But uh, yeah, no, it should work on on every Linux device. Okay, so you're saying Linux and not like Mac or PC? Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't think that there's any, any physical interface to uh, triggers like that. Um, other than maybe web services like API calls, but not any like physical um, interfaces like that, other than in, unless it's a, a Raspberry Pi or a Beagle or something like that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any other questions or has anybody yeah. made something that they wanted to talk about? You see several in chat. So John Larson asked, can you do, and I know Daryl, you started to respond. So can you do an ESCQ file on a group in the general sense is, is <laughs> you know, it's, you know, export yeah. yeah you know it's funny is as i was getting prepared for this um i tried that and uh it does not work uh yeah. so that was unfortunate yeah being um, able to export as ESCQ is on a model basis not on a group basis correct That's yeah and um but you know for for what i tell people with the wings too is um I just use one file for one wing and then you just copy it to both, you know, the start channel for both outputs to the same thing. And then it's just run, you know, both wings are identical. So it's one, one model in that case, if, if you were doing like a selfie station. And John, I don't know if you want to ask your other question or you want me to read it out of chat. Basically, how can you, how can you set up your in and out board to act like a relay? So it's was. actually a different a different way to look at it. So you, you want to use the in and out board. You, you trigger the in and out board with a relay. So um, whether that is a physical input like this or something that is digital, like a remote control relay or the brake beams or the motion sensor, all of those devices plug into the in and out Pi hat to trigger the GPIO pin. Um, the 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 um, the the Pi Hat itself is not a relay. Uh, it is a low voltage, you know, um, board. It is for changing logic signals only, not for switching high high current loads. Hopefully, that answers your question. Did you make the selfie station plans uh, product materials list available? Was that something you did for one of the Mega Minis or something, or no? Yeah, so there's a there's a video on YouTube. So if you just search for push button podium, um, it's probably going to be the first result, and that has everything listed. And then the on our website experiencelights.com, um, there's also uh, just like the um, the wood and the cut the cut sizes and stuff like that. So we take you through how I built it. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen like Tony Bigda took that and like plused it times eleven, and his is way cooler. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, I have the YouTube video. It's like 35 minutes. It takes you through the physical build, the wiring, and the FPP config, like front to back. So just search for push button podium on, on YouTube and it goes through all that. Yes, James. Hi. Um, yeah, I see that you covered only GPIO inputs, um, but you did cover scripts. Do you have any scripts which uh, can drive like through API the GPIO outputs? You can certainly drive the GPO outputs. Um, you're going to definitely want to use a relay in that case because um, you're going to be uh, and through some sort of protected device because that is going to be pulling current, which you don't want to source from your GPI open. So you need to have some sort of device that is is safe for triggering the outside world. And I don't know. Maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if there's anything in the hobby that we have that does that but i know adafruit has pi hats that are for that for I mean, 
I've, I'm absolutely doing that like 100% DIY, but I really want to be able to plug in through FPP. And uh, I got this problem that I've basically got a cult board, so it is protected. And I'm driving uh, through Serial. I'm driving Renard, a um, bunch of you know SSRs through Renard uh, protocol. And I want to be able to not through FSEQ or e ESEQ, but through Python drive Renard protocol through a script. And I'm looking for a way to do that. And I was hoping this GPIO would uh, cover that, but you only covered inputs. Yeah, well, that's that's going to be a much more complicated <laughs> subject, what you're describing, because that's actually piping out some pretty high speed serial, right? So that's that's not going to be uh, probably through FPP. That's going to be through, like you said, it's going to be some external process that right. will, will trigger your process to start, but not through the um, the GPIOs within FPP. Yeah, exactly. It's an FPP run script command, and I want to be able to DIY going from there. I, I do I do have an example of a GPIO output trigger in a relay when we get to the point of sharing examples. I don't know okay, if great. your answer or not, but I can happily share that one. So great. is that is that something that you made, Ron, or is that like an out of fruit hat? No, it's actually a it's just a relay. Um so I'm using it to trigger the relay, triggering it through ground. And um so I power the relay separately. So I'm just doing a zero volt round pull down. Um, but I'm not doing an input, so it's um I use it to turn my FM transmitter on and off. So it's a, my FM transmitter is connected to that relay. So then I can either by way of a playlist command or an FPP command set GPIO um, on to turn the relay on, therefore turning the, the FM transmitter on. And then at the end of the show, I mm -hmm. set that GPIO to off, which then turns the relay off, hence turning off the, the FM transmitter. Nice. Now, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if but the, I can share it anytime if you want to see it in action. But yeah, I'm yeah, maybe, and maybe the one you have is is protected. I guess my concern with that is uh, if you're powering the co coil directly, <coughs> from, you know, if there's kickback that might. It's a it's a really it board. It's not really itself. So it's a I bought the, okay. uh, these like eight or ten of these um, low voltage, and you can trigger it off a low or high. But it's a relay board with protection and stuff on it. Sure okay, perfect. Connected in there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, nice. and I can. Yeah, yeah. If you want to share, I'd I'd love to see it. It's um. I don't know if I have a picture of that right now, but what I did is within FPP set command presets, and then I just named the command preset to relay on, and I'm using pin number eighteen. So then the FPP command is just GPIO, and if I edit this. This would be setting GPIO pin 18 on. And if I run now, I just heard it click. So the relay just turned on. Um, and then I've got one called relay off as a command preset. And this one basically is just the same setup, just it's not on. So therefore turning it off. So if I say run now, turn that off. So now I'm practicum and I don't have a playlist set up on this one. Um, well, I did actually set this up. So, um, and this is an example, uh, I've got a playlist, I was working with it called Power. So in my lead in, I would just add a sequence item called trigger command preset called FM on. That way I don't have to remember what pin it is. I don't have to remember the state. I can just use trigger command preset. So in the, in the lead in, I would trigger the command preset. My main playlist will do whatever I want to the main playlist. And then as a lead out, do FM off. So nice. if I were to status control and say this, choose that power playlist since I have it there, there's what it's going to do. When I hit play, I just heard the relay click on. And now it's running. In this case, it's a pause for 20 seconds. And it's got like 12 seconds remaining. Um, but this could be song one, song two, song three, song 10, and just looping for all of my time. And then at the end of the night in the lead out, command preset FM off. And right there, and I just heard the relay turn off. The relay just turned off. Nice. So that's just an that's, example. That, that is really cool. something pretty simple. But just, and then um, let me stop sharing, and I can find the the actual relays I ended up using. They're a five volt triggered relay. Um, so I'm actually triggering. Come to think of it, this is a five volt triggered. So I'm using the five volt output pin um, through some protection. So uh, let me see if I can find that real quick. If you want to see which relays, there are many choices of these, but. Uh, helps if I can type.
they're opto isolated in this case. Nice. Yeah. Uh, um, share. I would, I so would I highly recommend no relays attempt to hook up a relay directly to a GPI open. Yeah, the, op so. the opto <laughs> isolation is good. Yeah. 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 So I just bought this pack here. There's like eight of them or something like that for, in this case, $11, whatever. And um, so I've got several of these relays that I can set up and trigger. That's great. I doesn't really care. It's fun. And then I got a four Those lay. Those work on 3.3 volts too, by the way. They're they're engineered for five volts. They say five volts, but they work on three, three, three usually. Correct. And one thing we did determine is there are that same type of relay that's triggered off a 12 volt, likely will not trigger off a three and a half or five because it's just not enough to hit past that high voltage scenario. But yes, yep. the five volts or the five volt based trigger relays can trigger off three, three as well. Yeah, you stick a bipolar on that and you can trigger it with three, three. All right, uh, so you, well, you ran a command. So I see you ran an FPP command. Did you ever attempt running an, uh, an FPP run script command and then your script sure. ran the GPIO? Sure, sure, you certainly could. I don't really do a lot of the scripting, but another thing that you could certainly do is actually um, go to your uh, channel outputs and you can define an other output. Let's say this is a GPIO output on pin 18 is the one I was working with, right? And I want to enable this and say, this is start channel. I don't know, let's, let's say it's channel 160, 176. I don't know, whatever channel it needs to be. And I can actually do that in a sequence. So I can add like a single channel model in the sequence and I can do sequenced on offs on offs. I didn't know you could do that. That is yep. really cool. And then it would be this channel. So whatever this channel is. And so if I now go to X lights and say channel 176, turn it on, then it'll turn this GPIO on and turn off, we'll turn it off. You would use the inverted if you had to go backwards in case you're high triggered versus low triggered. But um, I did do this for a little bit too to kind of try to do some sequencing. Um, so this would be just a standard channel output. So it would take this channel number and it would output it to the GPIO pin. So if it's on, it would be on off it would be off so david you have anything else for us uh no i don't but i do it looks like there is a, a few questions 